Hi everybody, we're going to make a start, so good afternoon. Um, welcome to the session. My name is Laura Hill and I head up Cloud Essentials um, in our UK region. I'm going to host the session today. I'm joined by two presenters, uh, my colleague Navasha Sanalal, uh, who is a very tech savvy, highly experienced legal and compliance specialist. Uh, and also my colleague Johan van Schalkwerk, who heads up our technical team of specialists, bringing a lot of experience, practical knowledge around deploying Microsoft compliance and governance features. So the session we're going to host today, it's really designed to increase your level of understanding, increase your confidence in how to use Microsoft sensitivity labeling. So we're deliberately tag teaming between Navasha and Johan to give you input from a technical perspective, but also a compliance perspective, because getting labeling off the ground, very much a team sport um, between these kinds of roles. So we're going to cover much more than just what labeling is and how it works, um, rather try and sort of impart best practices, give you some lessons learned from our experience as a partner in this space. Uh, really broad range of industries, professional roles with us today. And I know you'll all be at different sort of points in your journey with um, with labelling. So we're going to try and cater for all as we take you through the session. Uh, format is going to be mics off through the content, but during which, you know, we'd love to capture some input from you. Keep an eye on the chat panel um, for some participation, please, um, via Slido. And also type questions as we go. We will definitely tackle them at the end of the session and we can come off mic and off record um, to do so if that's helpful um, but we will tackle them if the flow kind of works as we go through the session so don't hold back um, and make sure you put your questions in there so just to very quickly set the scene as to who we are we're presenting this session to you today as a very long-standing Microsoft partner so very specialist really in delivering professional services around compliance and governance so first and foremost you know, we help our clients create these conditions for minimizing risk in Microsoft 365, so protecting sensitive data, applying retention, practicing good hygiene around Teams and SharePoint, managing access, managing e discovery, et cetera, um, but also part of a wider strategy to consolidate data um, into Microsoft 365. So we help our clients migrate content in, perhaps that's from document management systems, perhaps it's from email archives, perhaps it's from third party um, solutions, third party security, third party governance platforms you know, into into Microsoft natively. So yeah, we're all about helping organizations manage that manage that risk. Um, but ultimately as well to kind of unlock the value of that content um, and surface it as knowledge, which is where a lot of our clients are heading uh, with generative AI and wanting to do that at minimal risk. So our business model is very much to work with clients over over the long term. Uh, we were talking as a team on Wednesday this week with a, a financial client and I happened to ask George, our founder, you know, when did we start working with them? And he said May 2003, you know, he rem remembered that precisely um, when we started working with them. So, yeah, very proud of, of two decades of, of working closely um, and in close partnership with with our clients and kind of, yeah, continuing to, to build the value that we deliver to them over time. So that's kind of who we are. Just want to paint a picture, I suppose, um, of the technology at the forefront of the session today. So on a daily basis, we are helping clients get more value out of Microsoft Purview. So Purview is this um, product family name for Microsoft's stack of features around data governance and, um, and compliance. And there's lots of linkages um, to the security features too. But if you, if you look at the stack of, as a sort of whole, it's actually very much designed to be put in the hands of non-technical professionals to use um, and to uh, be familiar with within Compliance Centre. So for some orientation on the labelling topic today, you know, we're zooming in around protecting files um, and emails, you know, wherever they live. This is this is our um, our space for today. But just to um, just to orientate you within the, the broader stack, you know, from left to right, there's features within Purview to help you discover data, um, you know, to help you find um, sensitive data or data that could constitute uh, risk or, or IP, um, you know, and inform those decisions on then what you want to do about it with the rest of the, the stack of capability. Like I said, today we're focusing on applying protections um, to, to particularly sensitive uh, files. Um, 
Then if you move through the stack, there are controls there to really enable you to play out retention, disposition policies, help you with records management. Uh, compliance manager is an interesting topic. It's a very underutilized area in our perspective. Um, it's where you can benchmark your approach around regulations against uh, standards. It's where you can kind of manage incremental improvement. It's where you can go and get information and support around auditing, for example. Then other solutions in the stack are uh, more around risky user behavior. So, um, so less about the, the management of the data itself, more about um, visibility over user behaviors and um, what might lead to ultimately data breaches, be it accidental, be it malicious, you know, and looking to kind of tackle that before any damage is done. Um, and also solutions there around e discovery. So um, perhaps reacting to subject access requests, um, perhaps internal, external kind of e-discovery situations and managing that workflow in an efficient way. So very powerful features as a whole. Microsoft has invested very heavily in this um, and continues to do so. You know, there's a very exciting direction of travel for this capability where Microsoft um, are really looking to provide a sort of single pane of glass, a single kind of control center um, for Microsoft 365, but also then spanning other data sources. Um, so even with, you know, with uh, lower tier licensing, there's actually a huge amount of uh, capability that you can get your hands on around Microsoft purview. Yet so often, we actually see these features laying very dormant, um, you know, perhaps because of a lack of internal capability or capacity, perhaps because of a lack of strategy around what can be quite an overwhelming area to tackle, um, perhaps because of a lack of join up between IT and risk professionals. And yeah, that's very much where we come in as a partner to pick you up wherever you are on this journey with those capabilities and then set you on course to make a high impact um, with these features, typically looking at a, a sort of 12 month window to really ramp you up. And that's because lessons learned over time is that it's very ineffective to tackle Microsoft compliance and governance in uh, sort of piecemeal projects, you know, much better to form a, a very logical, achievable roadmap, pull a cross functional team around it and start delivering um, adoption in a much more joined up way against a, a methodology. So our 12 month program plays out generally through three forms of, of professional services. And the one that this particular client thanks us for constantly uh, and that's making the biggest impact is the compliance panel. So one of our clients is a, a large oil and gas multinational. They had several failed attempts Again, things like labeling off the ground, a lot of internal complexity, a lot of external complexity as well. Uh, and as part of the program with us, they get access to the compliance panel, to this advisory panel where we help bring recommendations. We help them make decisions on policies, on controls, on deployment projects. You know, Johanna and Navash spend a lot of time with them, supporting them in very practical ways to get things uh, unstuck um, on their journey with, with Microsoft Purview. Second area that we take care of is technical design, deployment of those features against best practices. Um, and thirdly, supporting day-to-day -day activities and usage of all these features um, so that they can kind of uh, mature over time. A lot of this work that goes on is very iterative um, as organizations change um, and, and mature how they're using it. So yeah, the result is after 12 months, organizations are far further ahead in getting a grip on risk in Microsoft 365 than they would have been perhaps going it alone um, or perhaps you know working with more generalist technology partners without that sort of specific compliance knowledge. So hopefully that set the scene um, to, to where we're focusing today and, and where we're coming from as a partner. Um, maybe you can now set the scene from your perspective as we um, kind of get into the content today and just give us some feedback via this first poll to answer the question, how far have you got with Microsoft sensitivity labeling within your organization? Um, have you not started? Are you using default labeling? Um, are you using automated labeling? You can vote as anonymous. Um, if you could just do that in the, the right hand side chat panel should be where you find that. You can see it moving up and down. Just pause a moment. 
Okay. It looks like we've got a majority not started. So hopefully you'll get a lot of value out of the session today. Some using default and some more advanced into the automated labeling. And I know, Johan, you're going to kind of um, tell us the story of how the default and then unfolds into the automation today. Okay, super. Thank you. I shall um, let you carry forward then, Johan. Thank you very much. Yeah, so as Laura mentioned, we are diving a bit deeper into the Microsoft Purview environment and starting off obviously with data classification um, and why it matters. So from a non-technology perspective, uh, Nivasha, why is data classifications important and critical for your labeling um, and deployment journey within Purview? Okay. Afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Johan, for that question. So I'm going to try and answer, be as succinct as possible, but you know, with compliance and legal people, that's not always easy, but um, let's see how we do. So as I think everyone on this call is aware, we have seen significant increases in the volumes of data and greater connectivity and mobility in the way we work, especially over the last few years. So in addition to that, regulatory bodies around the world are recognizing and now enforcing an individual's right to privacy. In the face of substantial fines and reputational damage, we've seen organizations get taken down or, you know, huge reputational impact overnight. Um, there's this immense pressure on, on these organizations to discover and protect all their valuable data, especially personal data. And this is often across vast data landscape, multinational, uh, multi-geographic organizations. So from a Cloud Essentials perspective, uh, we believe in taking a holistic but practical approach to your data governance strategy. And I think it's important that we, as Laura also alluded to earlier, we look at more than just um, the matter at hand. We look at your holistic strategy, but that being said, we also understand that given the nature of um, the risks involved, your data governance strategy can never have a fixed end goal, but it's ongoing and it's an ever evolving risk based approach. However, um, there are elements that are key in a successful strategy from our experience, like having a, a data classification taxonomy. And I know we're going to say whilst data has become a currency on its own, it's also true that not all data is equal in terms of its sensitivity and risk. Therefore, it's even more important for organizations to take a risk-based approach to appropriately classify and label their data in order to ensure adequate and consistent protection. And when done properly, data classification supports a conscious and a thoughtful effort by an organization to a multitude of things. So this is their data discovery, information security, their data privacy, compliance, and their overall risk management. And from a legal and compliance perspective, if we look at legislation like the General Data Protection Regulation or the GDPR, as I'm sure everyone's familiar with, um, class, data classification is more important than ever, especially for companies that want to do business within the EU. Companies that correctly classify their data can now more easily comply with GDPR and similar regulations. And in the event of an order, prove compliance by logging, tracking, and reporting sensitive data. Um, and as Laura alluded to earlier, AI tools engulf the technology and assurance world in 2023. And in 2024, we see this continuing with a focus on the regulatory and ethical considerations that go with the usage of AI. So to get the most out of generative AI tools like Microsoft 365 Copilot, it's also important to have that solid data governance strategy. And that then means ensuring that your data is accurate, complete, reliable, and secure. And by doing so, you reduce your data governance risk and definitely optimize the results from Copilot. So classifying your data then helps you meet compliance obligations, but it also helps business leaders become more aware of the types of sensitive data being stored, who's accessing it. Appropriate access controls can then be set as a result of the data classification, uh, the data classification process to maintain confide confidentiality and then make data more accessible to the people who should be using it and prevent data loss and corruption. So classification of information is pivotal for any enterprise now to thrive and remain relevant 
as well as keep its integrity in this digital world. So, Johan, I don't know, maybe you can take us through why data classification is important from a technology perspective. Yeah, thank you, Navasha. Um, from a technology or deployment perspective, classifying your data and utilizing the sensitive information types is foundational to your purview journey, especially when you are maturing the purview adoption and bringing in automation. While Microsoft provides, as you'll see later on, 300 plus um, generic built-in sensitive information pipes, clients get the most value um, and successfully implement their purview solutions if they invest in creating um, custom sensitive information types that is designed to protect the organization's crown jewels. Um, if you overlook the step, it's really hard to match the deployment of sensitivity labels to sensitive information types and the crown jewels if it's not backed by a, a proper data classification taxonomy. Moving on to what data classification within Purview actually does. Um, so within Microsoft, as I mentioned before, out of the box, Microsoft Purview allows the organization to not only discover and understand their data and content within their Office 365 and tenant environment, but can also be extended to other cloud environments that is included in Azure or third party um, SaaS platforms. Um, through a data discovery, you'll have the ability to identify the built-in sensitive information types that is available within Microsoft Purview um, as a solution. There is also modern classifiers um, called machine trainable classifiers, where Microsoft bundles or use to utilize templatized formats to identify sensitive and risky information. For example, um, agreements or, or invoices or, or legal agreements. So those are classifiers and sensitive information types that is um, taught using machine learning to look for similar patterns um, in other documents to then classify them and protect them once you get to the protection phase. As I mentioned before, utilizing the Microsoft 365 data classification and sensitive information types exercise, you can extend the functionality utilizing um, connectors via the graph API um, within Microsoft Purview, which not to con be confused by Microsoft acronyms is Azure Purview, where you can bring in um, more structured data sources and data from other locations, such as on-prem or other cloud platforms into the Purview environment so that you've got knowledge of where your data and sensitive data is located. And as you mature within your Purview adoption and deployment, also start implementing the data protection and data retention and controls on these external platforms through the features that's available through the, the native or third party data connectors. Um, moving on where to find it. So both of you should be familiar with the Microsoft 365 Admin Center and Purview is located within the Compliance Admin Center. And data classification is just underneath the home screen uh, screen where you can start off, as I mentioned, out of the box information around your environment. Uh, I'm just jumping quickly to my live demo so I can walk you through a couple of the features of data classification. So as I mentioned, starting off, you get an overview page, which out of the box, whether you have configured any Microsoft Purview features or not, or really give you a summary of all the sensitive information types that Microsoft has published within your organization. You have then the ability to produce these metrics 
uh, when you start creating your data classification taxonomy by providing the sensitive information types that already exist in your environment to your compliance and legal team that they can use this reports and information when they start building their taxonomy. You also have the ability then to actually dig into Content Explorer with the right permissions and actually go into specific locations to go in and confirm that the sensitive information types that has been identified is actually true and not false positives. All very much part of the reporting and monitoring and loopback um, program that is part of your purview journey. I'm getting back to quickly on my presentation. The next section that we want to cover is um, what it looks like and where to start. So where to start um, is really critical to the successful starting journey of implementation, as I mentioned before. And here is another question that we want to ask you. Um, and that basically is what are the main barriers that you are facing today with getting started to doing a data classification within your organization. Um, so if you can please answer within the side of Blood Bowl, we'll then be able to give you some feedback on the word cloud of the most responses we get today. Laura, any interesting words coming up? I can't see the results, unfortunately. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah there's quite a lot, actually. Yeah, there's quite a lot. Okay. Too many options, too much data, options, a lack of perceived value, classification, data coming up as the top words, um, internal knowledge, confidential need the class need the taxonomy definition leadership um yeah i think that's very common yeah. issues mm -hmm. and challenges we see and i think jumping to what we recommend the journey is and where to start will probably address a lot of these so nivasha um do you want to start and take the, the attendees today of what we do as our starting point for classification taxonomy. Yeah, sure. Those barriers really do uh, prompt a lot of the steps I'm about to take you all through, or phases rather. So I'm hoping that you get a lot of value from these, from our process. Um, and our process is obviously, it has been born from our experience with clients and um, just taking that pr practical but holistic approach as we've, um, as we had, uh, spoke to earlier as well. So data classification, as many of you probably already know, is the specialized term that's used in the fields of cybersecurity and information governance to describe the process of identifying, categorizing, and protecting content according to its sensitivity or impact level. So in its most basic form, um, class data classification is a means of protecting your data from unauthorized disclosure, alteration, or destruction based on how sensitive or impactful it is. So using sensitive lab sensitivity labels effectively requires that your organization's information be categorized and classified based on its sensitivity and risk. And the Cloud Essentials approach to data classification, as you'll see on the screen, um, really assesses an organization's information and gathers supporting um, supporting uh, evidence that is essential for configuring your labels. And we believe that starting with a risk-based approach and targeting your most risky and important data is key. Uh, one of our founders, Chris, he always says, you don't need to try and boil the ocean. You just need to manage uh, and manage all your data from the start. Over time, you get there. But what you need to focus on is your, your biggest gains are made up front. 
by employing this risk-based approach. So as I mentioned, this is an ongoing approach. Um, and what we've done is we've, uh, we've um, broken this up into five phases. And each of these phases are really designed to be an interactive process and the results of which are intended to ultimately support a variety of your organization's governance uh, efforts. And one of which is the deployment or the creation rather of a data classification taxonomy. So diving right into our phase one, it's our review phase. So here we recommend our clients check with their business as to what work has been done. And I know you might say, oh, but we've done nothing. Chances are there are existing taxonomies. There might be data infrastructure charts, or there might be data management policies. And in as much as, yes, it's not a taxonomy, these are all key documents in helping you create and drive data classification and sensitivity labels. So I think, Johan, based on our, um, you know, our approach of technology meets compliance, can or compliance meets technology, depends on your perspective. Can you maybe also tell us uh, what this first phase will entail from a technology perspective? Yeah, I think the power from Microsoft Purview is it really provides you with a lot of reports and data and dashboards that you can use to discover your sensitive information types that's applicable to your organization and, and function and really use that metrics within the risk-based approach to lock down your highly sensitive information within this risk-based approach. Um, but very useful is not to only utilize the, the native sources that's within your tenants, but really expand the discovery to all your data locations, even if it's just for this initial discovery phase. So as I mentioned, you can extend the discovery of your data to on-prem file servers, share points, even endpoint devices, and even more structured locations such as SQL databases or um, document um, document management systems where custom graph API connectors can be created so that information around the full data estate is visible within purview. This really empowers um, the IT team, the technology team to give information and stats um, to the compliance team that will need to go to each business unit to discuss and lock down and identify each of their crown jewels um, based on their risk appetite. I think that Thanks. covers step one. Yeah, uh, thank you. That's perfect. I think that really overlaps into our step two. Uh, where we say this is your gather phase. So our objective here is really gaining visibility on what to protect and why. So it's important to understand your reasons for classifying your data and your goals. So in as much as your data governance, they, there's no fixed goal, it's ongoing, but what's your goals for your taxonomy? What, you know? So this could include ensuring compliance with regulations, protecting sensitive information, or improving existing data management processes. And this is usually achieved, uh, we've seen success with interviews with stakeholders, or you could engage uh, with Cloud Essentials or, co or another consulting firm to help you with this. Um, and this phase should really be organized around business processes and driven by process owners. You need to consider each business process, which then allows you to track the flow of data to provide insight into what needs to be protected and then further how it should be protected. So some of the key questions for this phase, um, specifically for our process owners, would include what type of data do you handle in your team? Who has access to your data? Um, and how sensitive is the data? Obviously, this isn't a closed list. There's a whole array of questions, um, but all this input, or rather all the outputs from these interviews then get um, rolled up into your taxonomy. So then we move to your consult phase. And this phase is really aimed at identifying and collaborating with the correct stakeholders to take the business and regulatory uh, and operational um, requirements you have identified in your previous steps um, and then turn them into your taxonomy framework. So here it's, the, it's important to engage with the right stakeholders to help you avoid a number of the barriers for adoption that we identified earlier. So the outputs from this phase should enable you to create a clear, concise policy that 
outlines the classification categories, but it also outlines the responsibilities of data owners and the procedures for classifying and handling data. So our phase four is really where we see our taxonomy come to life. And in this phase, organizations need to align roles and responsibilities. And again, I know this was a barrier that came up earlier. And here we identify processes to get ready for the implementation of controls as required by the taxonomy, such as getting technology ready. So such as the decision if if, if you were going to do that uh, to take micro to uh, Sorry, to enable Microsoft purview controls. So some of the actions within this phase is to establish procedures and controls for handling data based on its classification stage. And this also includes controls like access controls, encryption, and data backup and recovery. And let's move on. So our last phase um, is implementing or implementation of controls. And it's really a title deliver because they saw, there's a few things that happen here. So one of um, the outputs here is the, the rollout and finalization of your documented data classification sca taxonomy schedule. And then you're also looking at implementing controls across people, process and technology. So some of the action items within this phase include ensuring all relevant parties within the organization are aware of the data classification policy, but also are they aware of their responsibilities relating to it? So this may include providing training or making other resources available for employees to reference. Um, this phase should also make provision for the creation of new labels, should this be required in the future. And in our experience, we've, we have found that a classification a taxonomy can roll into maybe four or five sensitivity classifications. So for example, an organization um, who engages with its tax or legal teams may have their requirements, finance is theirs, HR will have theirs, but they actually all roll into the same protection requirement. So highly confidential access restricted might mean one thing to finance, but it might mean something else to HR. However, the classification level does the same thing. Um, and it's really important to understand that correctly applying the right level of data classification can be complex in real life situations and often overwhelms users. Therefore, it's so important to have this data classification taxonomy or policy. And once the standard has been created, it really helps to define the, the required levels uh, of data classification, but it also serves as a daily guide to end users to execute in their work. Cool, thank you, Nevash. Um, yeah, I think so. Then it gets us to, we have the classification taxonomy, we have our sensitive information type defined and created, and that leads us into being able to start the journey of information protection. But for the purpose of today, um, just walk through the same steps with the classification um, and focus in on information protection. I'm starting off with why it matters. Um, so why it matters is really important um, these days as it's a, a modern protection of your data as the collaboration and sharing of data out of the organization, um, out of the legacy perimeter controlled, it has expanded exponentially. What um, information protection and sensitive labels allow you to do is to ensure that the files are protected at rest regardless of where it is stored, whether it's on a user's machine, whether it is uploaded and published to a SaaS platform, and whether it is shared with an external party by an email. Um, and I think from my perspective, that is the biggest requirement for information protection. But yeah, over to you, Nivasha, for why from a legal and compliance perspective, for governance and compliance perspective, information protection is critical and key for any organization. Thanks, Johan. So I just spoke about having a, a classification taxonomy, and I think all that hard work that you put into getting to your data classification um, taxonomy or policy is then given teeth in the form of your information protection deployment. So you might be wondering, and I know Johan, you, you probably, I think you alluded to it earlier as well, like the default, um, the, there are a lot of default labels. So why go through your data classification taxonomy process when we could just do that? So 
it's important to note that default labels don't factor in the risk attached to your various um, data sets. And this is where we see a big gap uh, between clients who have invested in doing the or going through a data classification process um, and a default rollout um, not supported by your data classification taxonomy could create a false sense of security. So from a compliance perspective, it might assist you or from an audit perspective, it might assist you to pass an audit to have um, you know, a classification or, or, or rather to have a, a default rollout of sensitivity labels. But does it actually assist in the prevention of a data breach of your highest risk data um, and against your highest risk uh, behaviors? Um, highly unlikely. So information protection controls, uh, they perform many important functions and they shouldn't be looked at as a tick box exercise, but rather um, it must be organized in such a way that they provide protection, uh, as you said already, Johan, for data at rest, so data stored on your hard drive and data in motion. And it's it's not merely a compliance um, requirement, but it's a critical part of our business strategy because it keeps unauthorized individuals from gaining access to a system and detecting when security violations have occurred, and thus informing your incident and breach process, um, and which is key to your risk management strategy. Thank you, Nerasha. And so over after what it does actually, what the technology within information protection within Purview can do for organization. Um, as mentioned, you can leverage manual labeling where end users are required to classify and protect their documents and email themselves. But as you mature in the Purview adoption, you move to fully automated labeling where based on the sensitive information types that is linked to your taxonomy it dictates what label and what protection and encryption is applied to the content and applied to the file uh, regardless of where it is saved, where it is saved or with whom it is shared this really allows the organization then to ensure through the built-in encryption and access control functionality within the sensitivity labels to ensure that the data is always protected at rest, regardless of where that file is. That protection is embedded within the sensitivity label. So even if a user accidentally or maliciously copies data to a USB drive or share it to an external party, you can control the access and re proactively revoke access even if that feature is enabled within your label. Um, it can be fully customized to meet your data protection uh, and classification taxonomy requirements. Uh, as uh, Nivasha mentioned, you can, in, in, you can configure the protection level based on your requirements um, and business, business needs. You can also integrate this with additional purview functionality, such as data loss prevention, where um, highly sensitive files with your um, most secure sensitivity label, your highly confidential internal only or similar name, will be blocked by data loss prevention policies to from being shared externally or even um, printed or edited or copied to the endpoint device DLP functionality. I'll show a lot of these, some of these functionalities in um, what it looks like coming up shortly. Where to find it? So similar to data classification, it's a purview solution. So it's found within the compliance admin center from an administrative perspective. This is where you'll find the, where you can configure the policies and the labels, but similar to um, the classification, already out of the box, have an overview page where you can already get metrics of how labels is being used within your organization. And that leads me into what it actually looks like. And I'm going to jump into my live demo. So just bear with me, I'm going to share my screen. So yeah, moving in my demo session down to information protection, clicking on the overview. As I mentioned, you get a view of how labels is currently being used in the organization. 
And for any client that has got a fresh, unconfigured purview um, environment, Microsoft even provides step-by-step -step guides and recommendations of where you can get started um, with your deploying your information protection. But what, once it's deployed, these metrics from an administrator's perspective is, needs to be continuously used within the feedback and improvement loop to ensure your labels are correctly applied and if there's any gaps or issue identified, adjustments to the policies um, is made to ensure the effectiveness of your technology control matches your taxonomy, data governance, um, and the policies you have in place to so ensure technology enforce those and uh, it's successfully adopted and implemented. You'll see there is um, in my lab, I'm just opening up the labels is currently defined there, so you can get an overview of what we have. We've got a few generically named labels. And what I want to do now is actually show you the view of what um, this functionality looks like for an end user. So I'm jumping here to a machine where I am logged in as a, an end user. Her name is Megan. And seeing what labeling will actually look like in action. So if I create an email and send it to a user in my organization and I copy in information that has been identified as either a, a built-in sensitive information type or a custom sensitive information type, if a user pastes that into an email, types it into an email or a Word document, they'll get either a suggestion um, if you have the default labelings or the suggested labelling functionality enabled, where based on the sensitive information that is in the email or within the Word document, that you can suggest what protection and what sensitive label must be applied to this content. So this is the middle ground um, that clients on our journey see with the adoption, moving from purely manual labeling, where a user has got the ability to choose their own label that they want to apply to the content. We can use the sensitive information types and our taxonomy to suggest what users um, should protect their content with. And this is very useful for improving the knowledge and experience for your users on their adoption journey of how to use sensitivity labels before you get to fully automated labeling. Um, if I accept the recommendation, you'll see the protection that is applied to the, this email apply. Um, so I'm going to send this email. Um, this is with another PLA policy, but you can ignore that. Very similar to a Word document. So Microsoft has unified the experience with sensitive labels across all the Office, office applications, whether it's the full client, the web client, or a mobile client. The similar interaction is, um, is seen across all of the applications. So if I do the same within a Word document, I'll expect it that suggestion to pop up once Microsoft, uh, their, their, their robots in the back end has assessed the document. And there again, within Word, I can choose to apply the sensitive content and very nice in Word. It highlights all the sensitive information types that it picked up. And I can even get more information of why these, this is being flagged as sensitive information type. The example on screen is social information, um, SSN number, or a credit card information. To show you the protected functionality so that the label ensure the document is protected at rest, I'm going to just manually assign a label. 
and choose a specific user that can have access to this file. Uh, okay, so I, as a user, have chosen the highly sensitive sensitivity label, and I've given Alan de Jong, another user in this organization, only read access. So if I save this document, I'm going to save it to my documents folder. Just call it Alan test. Okay. This document should now be protected so that only Alan can read this document. Here I have logged in as Alan de Jong within a web browser. And if I um, if I to go to that shared file, so I just want to get a file with Alan quickly. Documents. Alan can be quicker and be trying to copy with him. Okay. Should get the email quite quickly. Go. If I open the document either within my web browser. I would get a or within full client. I will get a prompt that I can only read this document. I can't make any changes to the document. I can't open it in Word, but it will be the same um, experience for this end user. To simulate, to simulate if somebody tries to copy this file to a USB drive, I am actually going to copy this file to a map folder on my machine. And then I, as an external party with no permissions on the file, is going to attempt to open this file and we should get a blocked. block. So there it is pasted. Okay. For the copying to finish. Um, while this copying is finished, um, I'm going to jump back to the admin center. If I go into the overview page, um, I can go into the the summary view of all the labels that have been applied to your environment. But very similar as I see see all the activities that has been applied to all files. Being logged within the activity explorer. Um, let's see if that file has finished copying. Okay, I've got an issue with that, but yeah. Um, unfortunately, let's see if I try again. Yeah, something is obviously yeah. Uh, the demo bug is hampering me today. So yeah, let me jump back and just reshare the British presentation again. So then finishing off with where to start, and I think we've mentioned it a few times already. Um, but yeah, the default labels that's published by Microsoft is a great starting point for any client on their labeling journey, as long as it is backed by a clear and defined taxonomy. Um, so that you get the value of it actually is the controls and restrictions that is built into these native um the native sensitive the labels is actually backed by a policy procedure uh, and not only left to the technology to enforce these controls. Um, but but very important on your labeling implementation journey, as I mentioned before, we recommend and take our clients through three main phases. So obviously 
from designing the labels based on the taxonomy and controls to find there through pilot testing and validation. The production phases needs to go through continuous improvement and, and um, automation steps by starting off with only manual labeling where users are left to manually um, assign labels to their content. Moving to maturing to default or suggested labels where documents created by risky departments such as HR by default gets a more restrictive label for all the content and also suggesting labels like you would have seen on the demo where you suggest labels to use based on the information types. And the last journey, the last block within this journey is then to go to fully automated labels where protection and labels is applied automatically, not only at the client level, but also on the back end um, on SharePoint, OneDrive and team locations. So um, for retrospective files or old files, Microsoft will cycle through them on schedule to update them based on their sensitive information and also then extend that to that automation to on-premise locations um, through the um, information protection labeling agents. So you can apply labels to files on-premise and other SaaS platforms that support that functionality. I think that wraps it up from the high level discussion today. Um, I think I'll hand over here back to Laura to wrap it up before we get to the questions. Thank you. Thanks, Navasha. Thanks, Johan. Um, yeah, so just to, to kind of summarize um, and talk about quick wins, you know, to through the session, Navasha has brought up this, this sort of five step process for formulating the classification taxonomy. And it really is an unavoidable place that you need to start and maybe it doesn't feel like a quick win um, but it will mean that you can accelerate a lot quicker with deployment and not fall into these sort of common traps that cause labeling deployments to to fail at the first hurdle. Johan you talked to us about using the technology that you've actually already got to be curious about sensitive data that you could be carrying right now to just feed into the start of that process um, as well. You know, the capability is likely sitting there waiting for you to run some data discovery, and we'd certainly advise that as a quick win. Um, you know, great if you've already got sensitive information types to go looking for. If not, use what's out of the box. And the the poll that we did, you know, there was some some um, concepts there that you were giving us feedback about that talked to leadership, it talked to perceived value, it talked to interest um, in this area. And our experience really is that step one, that that discovery um, can be a real catalyst for building that business case, for elevating um, the, the business value of this to leadership um, and often to the points that Navasha started with on the business outcomes, you know, on risk, on efficiency, on competitive advantage um, as real solid business value, business outcomes of, of this. Navasha, you talked us through a risk-based approach being the most effective, um, you know, an advice there about being very intentional about taking a, a risk-based approach from the outset. And certainly our rallying cry as a business always has been, always will be, you know, bring multiple stakeholders into this. It is a team sport, it is a collaboration. And finally, you know, Johan, you talked to us about um, default labels uh, and Navasha heeding that warning. Yes, default labels are great use them for quick wins, but only if they're very, they are relevant, you know, there is a meaningful policy to uphold them, um, you know, circling back to where we started around um, the importance of that groundwork in the classification taxonomy. Um, so thank you, um, Navasha, thank you, Johan, thank you for giving us your feedback in those polls, really interesting to see that a lot haven't started and to see those barriers, you know, confusion, complexity with some of the words coming through, false positives um, were coming through as well. So we're going to wrap up the, the presentation now um, and um, stop the recording. Just want to mention if you wanted an hour um, with us, you know, quite informal, just to talk about barriers a little bit more, um, to thrash out issues that you're seeing and, um, you know, have a little bit more knowledge imparted from uh, Navasha on your hand, then you can certainly get in touch with us and it would be a pleasure to, to organise that.